Chairman of the House Rules Committee is New York Representative Louise Slaughter. This hearing is about two hours. I think it would be the appropriate way to proceed uh, for uh, this committee uh, to uh, insist uh, on the right of the minority be, of the minority to be heard. Uh, as I've said uh, often, uh, the uh, I think the essence of representative democracy is obviously ruled by the majority, uh, but just as important as ruled by the majority is uh, respect for the right of the minority. And so with regard to procedural uh, vehicles, uh, such as a, uh, a substitute by the minority uh, and uh, or a motion to recommit with instructions, I hope that uh, that will be made possible at the end of uh, the evening. Uh, with regard to the substance of what the majority is doing, has decided to do this week on the floor of the House, in view of the fact that the world is watching, uh, I think that uh, the approach <coughs> is the wrong approach at the wrong time. Uh, we are in a very difficult moment in Iraq. Uh, the United States, it's not the first time in history that the United States, as the leader of the free world, is facing a difficult challenge uh, in helping a new democracy uh, survive. Uh, the world is watching. Uh, the stakes are very high very high in Iraq. The consequences of the message that will in all likelihood be sent this week may be very dangerous. Unfortunately, I think the message that will be sent out to the world this week is that the path chosen by the majority in the Congress is one that will ultimately lead to a, to leaving a withdrawal from Iraq before the situation is stabilized, that we would leave, in effect, prematurely. So while recognizing the difficulty of the current situation, I think it's important to look at the alternatives and the possibilities very, very live, very genuine, very, very real possibilities that exist if we do, in fact, leave prematurely. ethnic cleansing on a massive scale. The collapse of the current government. The creation of an Al-Qaeda statelet, at least in the Anbar province. A very dangerous emboldening of our enemy in the region, our most serious and dangerous enemy in, our re in the region, the Iranian dictatorship that has already embarked on a path uh, that I believe is reckless and is extremely dangerous not only to our allies in the region but to our own national security. So I would hope that as we move forward this week, we realize that the world is watching and that grave consequences may ensue from our acts and our actions. And so, obviously, we will all engage in the debate this week. But I am, uh, I am concerned. I am generally concerned uh, about where we may be leading uh, circumstances and situation in the world, in the world, and especially in that region, because of the statement that we will be sending out this week. And so, having said that, again, Madam Chair. With gratitude for your recognition uh, and your courtesy, uh, I uh, simply uh, reiterate my petition to my dear colleagues on the majority side of the aisle in this committee that they exert the influence of this committee uh, and, uh, and ask for the minority to be heard in this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diaz Ballard. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, the quality of 
the discussion as offered by the four uh, of you that have uh, spoken already is indicative of what I believe of the next um, of three days here in the United States House of Representatives will provide the American public. There is no question but that there are serious disagreements, serious people that have serious disagreements, and that is on both sides of the aisle or here in the United States House of Representatives. They are. Um, my colleague from Florida just reflected about the fact that the world is going to be watching the next three days. I would urge that the world has been watching the war in Iraq now for more than four years. Um, we live in a world that gets information much more rapidly uh, than at other times. Therefore, the best thing that could happen would be that the world will have an opportunity to see and hear um, uh, the members of, uh, that represent uh, them here in America and elsewhere. Now, let's get one thing very clear and straight. There is no member of the House of Representatives who does not support the American military. Every one of us, Republican and Democrat, stand firm in the determination to support and to protect the American who are serving now so bravely and honorably um, in Iraq. And I might add, although this particular resolution does not reach um, uh, that area, uh, Afghanistan as well. Madam Chair, I think it helpful, even though it is in the record, uh, that uh, the concurrent resolution be read into the record. And with your permission, it is very short. And because of its unambiguousness, because of its brevity, or because of its clarity, it gives us an opportunity for an up or down vote uh, and a very clear vote um, uh, that will reflect uh, uh, the sentiments of uh, those of us uh, that represent people. I'd like first to thank um, uh, Chairman uh, uh, Skelton and Chairman Lantos uh, for uh, their thoughtfulness and uh, Mr. Jones of North Carolina, uh, the original scriveners of this resolution. I'd also like to thank uh, Sam Johnson and Steve King and Frank Wolf and John Shattuck and Mike Pence uh, for uh, the um, uh, thoughtfulness uh, that has gone into their preparation of the amendments and the nature of a substitute that they would offer. Um, the concurrent resolution simply reflects disapproving of the decision of the president announced on January 10, 2007, to deploy more than 20,000 additional combat troops to Iraq, resolved by the House of Representatives, the Senate concurring, that, one, Congress and the American people will continue to support and protect the members of the United States Armed Forces who are serving or who have served bravely and honorably in Iraq. And two, the Congress disapproves of the decision of President George W. Bush announced on January 10, 2007 to deploy more than 20,000 additional United States combat troops to Iraq. Madam Chair, that's extremely clear. Uh, today we have a bipartisan resolution uh, that is not, I might add, about whether we are going to war. We are already at war. Previous resolutions uh, that permitted substitutes, as a, for example, were about whether or not to go to war. Here we are dealing with a specific policy shift announced by uh, the Commander-in-Chief of the United States last month, and in my view, 
it deserves a straight up or down vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Hastings of Washington. Thank you. I, uh, I want to say that this is a very, very serious issue, and I think all members sitting here and all members, indeed, of the House take their positions uh, very seriously. But I, what I wonder about, though, is why we as a body should be engaged in a debate that really doesn't have any policy implications. I want to associate myself with what uh, my friend from uh, Florida, Mr. diaz Villard, said about the consequences uh, of our not attaining victory in, in this effort. Uh, I think we need to look long term at, uh, at all of this, and this resolution simply doesn't do that. I appreciate uh, my friend from Massachusetts very forthrightly saying that he was opposed to the war right from the very start. I, I appreciate his intellectual honesty. And he'll have an opportunity later on, I hope, for those that share his views to express that point of view when we go through the process of funding uh, the future war efforts. That's what the responsibility for Congress is. Now, we're, everybody's going to have to make a decision. It seems to me to run a bit counter to saying, on the one hand, that you support the troops, but we will be willing to cut off funding. But that's all right. I mean, you'd, you'd have to deal with that from an intellectual standpoint, and I'm sure that that will be taken care of. So while this is a very important issue, I just wonder about uh, spending as much time, at least as has been reported, uh, debating an issue that is non-binding, uh, how useful that is. In fact, I, I would again associate my, uh, myself with the remarks of Mr. diaz Blart because I think this does send a signal that may be very, very hard in the long term to, to undo. And finally, at the first Rules Committee meeting that we had here, Madam Chairman, you, you said, stated that it was going to be a closed rule. Uh, <coughs> We have uh, six members here that I want to testify on their amendments. They're all substitutes. They'd all be made in order. Are you talking uh, about, excuse me, if I could ask you to yield for a moment. You're I'm talking about the day that, the, the first one we had under 606? Uh, not I, today. I'm not, no, no, the first one, the first rules right, committee okay, meeting right. of this conference. I want to make that clear. We've yeah. not said that today. You stated at the outset that I did. That, that rule that we were debating would be a closed rule. I commit an act of honesty. Yeah. Uh, you, you did that. Now, I, I just wonder, there's, we're reading press reports that this may be a, a closed rule, and yet we have members here that want to testify uh, on their substitutes. Uh, and they're has welcome. Has that decision been made yet? I would just No, it's a, it is not. It has not. They're been. welcome. Okay. Well, I hope then that the testimony, and I think it will be a very thoughtful testimony of, uh, of my colleagues, their testimony will not be uh, in vain as we uh, pursue forward. So thank you, and you're back. Ms. Masui. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm hopeful today. Finally, four years into a very controversial war, Congress will begin to fulfill its constitutional responsibilities as representatives of the people. This week, every member of the House of Representatives will have an opportunity to express their views on the war in Iraq and cast their vote for or against the President's escalation of the war. And this is only right. The American people deserve to know where the elected representatives stand on such a critical proposal. And I'm glad that the House has finally found its voice. I have some 30 soldiers in the Sacramento area who have died in this war. I've met several times with members of the National Guard and Reserve and their families. Every member knows what I'm talking about. We've all done it, and we all know the pain. And in the face of an administration with little respect for straight talk and no reasonable plan for success, our constituents have had enough. Last November, they went to the polls to register their outrage over the trajectory of this war. They demanded a change in direction in Iraq. But the president ignored their voice several weeks ago when he proposed to send more than 20,000 additional combat troops into <clears throat> Iraq. It was not a new direction. It was indeed, in my opinion, a reckless one. It was more of the same, only at a faster pace with more human life placed in harm's way. I have opposed this war from the beginning. 
I also support several responsible proposals to redeploy our troops from Iraq. And I certainly oppose this escalation. We must recognize that the solution to Iraq is a political <coughs> and diplomatic one and not a military one. However painful the choices, we must keep the interests of our soldiers and our nation's security at the forefront of our minds. <coughs> and now is the time to find out where each and every member of Congress stands. We will do that this week by bringing forth a bipartisan proposal by Chairman Skelton, Chairman Lantos, and Congressman Jones. I thank them for their work. I believe that members on both sides of the aisle will join them by a wide margin in condemning this president's escalation. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I, like uh, many members that are on this side, uh, appreciate your words when you said that this uh, debate, and I assume rule, will be open, fair, and comprehensive. Uh, tonight, uh, Mr. Sessions, I believe I said we made no decision on the rule. Well, no, ma'am. I'm just saying what you oh, said, right. that it will be an open, fair, and comprehensive debate about the issue. And if you I, would yield for just a moment. I, as I, I sit here, I, I find myself asking, why in the world, if you guys are so concerned about debating this, why didn't you do it in the last four years? Oh, we've been to this war. I, I can't think how many times we've tried to talk about the war. And every now and then you do a resolution like you did last June, which was closed down completely. Nothing was allowed. And it was praising the president for Madam his- Madam Chair, we're claiming what, time. Of course. But you know that really, I, I'm sorry, that just keeps playing through my mind. That's OK. I it, don't it have any It strikes me as a sort of disingenuous so, I argument. I appreciate you, gentlemen. OK. I, gentlemen, I don't argue with my, I don't have any arguments with myself. Mm -hmm. I know where I am. I'm simply saying I appreciate what the gentlewoman said, that this will be an open, fair, and comprehensive debate. Tonight, we find ourselves in the Rules Committee looking at what will be debated on the floor tomorrow. And I respect each of the members on the Democratic side that have reiterated that they're for immediate withdrawal. Mm -hmm. They were from the beginning. Their mind has not been changed. They see that even the election reinforced the things which they thought about a long time ago. I respect that. I'm hopeful that, in fact, we will have an open, fair, and comprehensive debate. I come to this no different than the other 435 members of Congress, this debate. I have people back home that have intense feelings on both sides. I have met with the families. I have met with members of the military. And I hope that part of this debate is also about that the president really did hear about changes. And I think the American public recognizes that literally the day after the election, the president made some very difficult decisions and changes. I think the president thought about and worked with the commanders in the field about what changes would be necessary. Those changes that have been expressed to me were that Many people felt like we should add 100,000 additional troops. Some more, some less. I think the president has selected 20,000 additional because the thought is, is that they are going to put them in comprehensively, as, as opposed to spreading them out, they want to put them in an area to where they're able to clear an area and then control the area. What we've done up to now is we've cleared areas and we've come back. Cleared areas and come back. I don't believe there have been enough people over there in the first place. And I think that what this new proposal is that would be offered by the gentleman from Texas offers very specific and concrete ways that the Congress can negotiate and work with the President and expect to hear things that come back in terms of how successful are we? What exactly is the plan with these 20,000 additional men and women uh, combat troops? What are we aiming for? What are the results? And I find, just my own personal opinion, that simply saying, Mr. President, we disapprove of your decision, 
without there being a third paragraph that says, we're not going to leave you hanging. We're going to work with you on what's next. Because what will really happen is we're just saying this is all about politics and not about policy. And I hope that tonight when the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Johnson, is able to describe what I think the sense is of members of Congress on the Republican side is, is that whether we like it or not, we're a part of either the success or the failure, either standing behind our troops or just leaving them hanging with perhaps a president that gets no direction from us, no policy, only politics. And to me, that's sad. I think we should be about either saying, Mr. President, we're for immediate withdrawal, or Mr. President, we're for working with you. We're for doing the things, and we'd like to have you come and meet with us. We'd like for you to be a part of the problem with us. We'd like for you to be a part of the process, and we want to be a part of the process. And we've left the president with none of that. This is simply, Mr. President, Congress disapproves of your decision announced on January 10, 2007. And that's what we're saying. And I think if we're going to do policy, there ought to be a whole lot more to it. So that's what you're going to hear the Republicans tonight say, that we have been down this for four years with the President, and that we have not only given him our best wishes and the votes, not everybody in this Congress, but that what we're looking for is a more comprehensive opportunity. We value this on the Republican side. I don't know of many Republican members that feel like we've been necessarily consulted, that we necessarily always understood exactly what was next. Sure, we had lots of meetings with the Joint Chiefs. We've had lots of meetings with people. But we are now at the point where we do take seriously that the American public has spoken. And what our resolution that embodies itself in what Congressman Sam Johnson is going to put forth tonight, I think is comprehensive. And I think that would be a part of an open, fair, comprehensive policy discussion as opposed to politics. Gentlemen, yield. I would yield to the gentleman. I, I thank my friend for yielding. And I, I just want to very briefly say that, as, as the distinguished chair said at the outset, this is a debate for serious people, and it's a very serious issue. And I would just like um, to state for the record that I think that the use of the word disingenuous, and Mr. Hastings and I have actually gone through this in the past on the House floor is an inappropriate word to use. It's unparliamentary, and I'm not going to push this, but I hope very much that words like disingenuous will not be used to in any way, in any way, characterize the actions of any of our colleagues at all. And I thank my friend for yielding. I thank the gentleman for reclaiming would, my time. Would the gentleman yield for just one? I, I would yield to the yeah. gentleman. And since we're clarifying the record, I just want to address my good friend from Washington State uh, who implied in his opening statement that uh, that uh, I uh, called for the uh, immediate cutoff of funds, uh, which implied that somehow we would leave our troops uh, high and dry. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I believe in the, that we should provide the funds necessary to provide a safe and orderly withdrawal of our troops. Nobody's asking uh, to leave our troops uh, without the necessary support. I want, I want the record to, to reflect that, because uh, so there's no misunderstanding. We all support our troops. We all honor their service, uh, and they have sacrificed, and their families have sacrificed a great deal. And I know the gentleman didn't mean any, um, any, any, any malice in that, but I just I thought the record should reflect that. And Reclaiming Neal, my time. And I would yield to the gentleman. I, I, I simply <coughs> stated that I admired the uh, intellectual honesty that you had. And, 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 there, and I said it in the sense that you'll have opportunities in the fu future to be able to enact that, that to intellectual honesty, and part of that would be and if I, you don't want, yeah. if, is exercising Congress's role in our system of the purse. And I, I was just suggesting that if there's a conflict, I'm sure that you would have to. No, I appreciate work that the out intellectual honesty compliment. Well, it was the other part that I didn't. Yeah. But, but I, 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 I want to make that point out. Now, we'll, only time will tell uh, if, if that happens. But if to be, I think, intellectually honest as, you, as we move forward, 
that would have to be part of what the process is because that's the responsibility <coughs> that's for here. That is important. I appreciate it. Reclaiming my time. And I thank the gentlemen from uh, both sides for their clarification. Madam Chairman, uh, I would simply say that I believe that the members on this side and myself, I'll speak for myself, do believe that we need a comprehensive debate. We think that's fair. I believe that what is placed before us tonight, the only thing that I see that's really before us, this resolution, lacks, and it leaves us with a status quo. The status quo is what we are fighting against. We are a body of thoughts and ideas. We come to our jobs representing people. But I think that the collective wisdom of all of us, I hope, more than just, Mr. President, we're going to disapprove what you did, but we're not going to try and out thank you. We're not going to try and work with you. We're not going to try and provide a second opinion. We're just going to cut you off at the knees. And that's the way I feel. And I thank the gentleman for the time that she's extended. Thank you, Mr. Sessions. Mr. Cardos. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for providing us this opportunity tonight. I'm going to try and be brief, but I, and I hadn't planned on speaking at all because I'm trying to state for the American people in my district what my views on this conflict are when we have the opportunity mm -hmm. to debate this five minutes for each member. But I do support this resolution. That is <coughs> written, submitted tonight to the base resolution. Um, I think it's time that the former minority have the right to be heard after four years in this conflict. I am very concerned that we have not truly had that opportunity in the last four years, and I think it is time. And I couldn't agree more, disagree more with Mr. Sessions, because I'll tell you, Mr. Sessions, I wrote to the President several times, once on my own, and several times in individual letters where I laid out different courses of strategy in very strong detail. And I haven't even had the courtesy of one response back. So to tell us that we're not having, a, we're not giving any direction, I don't feel this president's listened to our direction. And I feel he should get the message that we oppose the escalation. It seems that's the only thing he might understand. There's something else that troubles me greatly here tonight. And that is when people say, if you vote for this clear statement of policy, you're not supporting these groups. Let me tell you that I have never, ever once in the last four years talked to anyone in my constituent, or frankly, anyone in the country, that I've heard is not supportive of our men and women who put themselves in harm's way. I feel that everyone I've ever talked to in my district, including all the veterans that I meet with regularly in my veterans advisory committee, all are very supportive of the individual soldiers and the incredible sacrifices that they make, leaving their families, putting their lives on the line, giving it all up for the country they love. It's also important that we do a good job managing the conflict so that they can have an opportunity for the best chance of success so that their sacrifice is not um, for not. I'm very concerned about the facts that I hear that, and I don't know the exact percentages, but a large percentage of Iraqis who I'm told one is out of the country, and a large percentage of Iraqis who believe it's okay to kill American men and women who put themselves in harm's way trying to save their country. I submit to this committee and to the House and the country that it's only the Iraqi people who can ultimately decide their own fate. We can assist and we should. We can help protect from <coughs> genocide and mass uh, killings, but ultimately we're not going to decide a conflict that's been going on in that part of the world for over 1,400 years. And I think we need to have a course of action that both protects our own country, protects that part of the world, and brings us to some kind of resolution as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you, Mr. Cardoza. Mr. Welch. I believe it is time to end this war. I believe the authors of the Bipartisan Iraq Study Commission know it. I believe a number of outspoken military leaders now retired know it. 
I believe an increasing number of Republicans and Democrats in this Congress know it. And the question is whether we're going to act and proceed to end this war. The question of the troops. The troops have done their job. What did the President ask the troops to do? Topple Saddam, he's gone. Eliminate weapons of mass destruction, they don't exist. Allow Iraq to have democratic elections, they have had three. Iraq is now engaged in a civil war, and it is the responsibility of the Iraqis to decide whether they want to end that civil war through bloodshed or through political negotiation. It is not the responsibility of the men and women of the American military to referee a civil war. It is not the responsibility of the American taxpayer to finance a civil war. The question that we face in Congress is very clear. Do we support the surge or do we oppose it? It's also very clear that the author of this question is not anybody on the Democratic side or on the Republican side. The author of this question is the President of the United States. The only question for us in Congress is whether we will accept the responsibility that each of us has, given to us by the people who elected us, to say yes or no, to accept accountability, clearly and directly. And it is for that reason that the only responsible thing to do is to debate openly the very question that the President of the United States has put to the American people and the people of this Congress, yes or no on the surge. I am prepared to vote no. I am prepared to accept accountability. I am prepared to take the first step to end this war. Ms. Castor. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is time to bring this debate to the floor of the United States Congress. Uh, I oppose escalation of the war in Iraq that is being pushed by President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Uh, I oppose sending more young American men and women uh, into the middle of a sectarian civil war, and I do not support a war without end. Now, in addition to the Rules Committee, I'm privileged to serve on the Armed Services Committee under the outstanding leadership of Chairman Ike Skelton. Uh, Chairman Skelton has reinstituted the oversight subcommittee at Armed Services that is needed. Uh, he has also scheduled numerous hearings for us already over the past few weeks. Some of the most striking testimony came from the Commandant of the Marine Corps and the Army Chief of Staff, who said that this escalation will degrade our readiness to respond to any other global threats that threaten our national security. For example, my colleagues from Florida who are here, the Florida National Guard at this time is rated at only 28% ready. 28% ready. That's an example. That is, that is the same story throughout the 50 states. And this was confirmed in President Bush's suggested budget that he sent over last week. <coughs> he has requested for just fiscal year, the rest of fiscal year 07 and fiscal year 08, $235 billion. Now, the entire Department of Defense budget request for this year is about $480 billion. The war in Iraq now is swallowing the Department of Defense budget and affecting our readiness to be able to address any other threats to this country. So we'll debate, we will debate the budget in the coming months, and we will debate appropriations. But the time is now, after four years of war in Iraq, after more than 3,000 American lives, uh, more than $300 billion in addition to the budget requests I talked about, uh, and the, the Bush administration's failure to aggressively pursue a political solution. It's important to have this debate in what they call the People's House, unlike the United States Senate, it's important for our members to go on record. And it is important to demand a new direction on behalf of the American people. Thank you, Ms. Castor. Mr. Arcuri. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, for yielding. <coughs> My constituents, like the majority of Americans, are very unhappy with the present course in Iraq, whether you call it a surge, whether you call it an escalation of troop buildup. They are unhappy. Um, three years after we, more than three years after we went into Iraq, um, we have spent over $370 billion. We have lost well over 3,000 brave men and women. It's become overwhelmingly clear that the current strategy to secure peace in Iraq is failing. And yet the administration contends that sending more combat troops into Iraq is the silver bullet solution to quell the ongoing violence. Even though as we debate this resolution, the casualty toll continues to rise. I could not disagree with the strategy more. This resolution establishes two clearly defined principles that are supported by a large majority of Americans. And I am confident will garner the support of many of my colleagues from the other side of the aisle. First, we support our troops. And second, we oppose sending additional troops into Iraq. Just this afternoon, I visited with some of our wounded soldiers at Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital. While I was there, I had an opportunity to talk with the parents of a wounded soldier from my hometown. During our conversation, I mentioned some of the statements made during a television talk show yesterday morning. One of our colleagues from the other side of the aisle posed two questions. The questions were, why aren't you allowing us an opportunity to offer our proposal on Iraq? And secondly, what is your answer on how to win? In response to the first question, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle had the better part of three years to use their position in the majority to change the course in Iraq. Yet, nothing was done. No resolutions, few if any hearings, and absolutely no accountability. Meanwhile, the casualty toll continued to rise and to escalate. By the results of the last election, it is clear the American people have had enough. They demand new hope and new direction. And now the time to begin to change that direction in Iraq is here. In response to the second question, how do we win? I guess, in my opinion, we win by stopping the casualties and by bringing as many of our troops home alive as possible. The devastating injuries I saw today firsthand um, in my visit to Walter Reed solidified my position that sending additional troops is not the answer. The question I would like to pose to my colleagues how many American lives are worth risking to continue this poorly planned strategy? 5,000, 10,000, 100,000? What we are proposing is a resolution that unites Americans and takes the first step toward bringing our brave men and women home, not a political resolution intended to further divide Americans. Thank you, Madam Chair. And are you Thank you, Mr. Arcuri. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Throughout the course of our collective history, when our nation has faced its most significant debates over matters of war and public policy, there comes a time when voices of pundits and politicians need to drop away, and we need to allow the voices of the people to be heard. Our troops are brave and capable. They have fought heroically. And this resolution makes it clear that those of us who feel it incumbent to speak out in opposi opposition to the president's escalation nonetheless support our troops. Paragraph one of this resolution is unequivocal. It states, Congress and the American people will continue to support and protect the members of the United States Armed Forces who are serving or who have served bravely and honorably in Iraq. All of us and all Americans support our troops. They must have and we must provide that which they need for any mission on which they are sent. We believe that they must have and we must provide that which they need when they return home. But Congress also has a responsibility to provide oversight, to ensure that our brave and honorable troops are provided a mission based on realistic assessments and an achievable goal before we ask them to risk life and limb to implement it. The President has asked Congress and the American people to support his plan to escalate our involvement in the war in Iraq by sending an additional 20,000 troops. And that doesn't count the additional 20,000 support personnel that will be part of the escalation. This war is now almost four years long. Congress has not spoken as loudly and as clearly as its responsibility requires. As a representative of the 13th District of Ohio, I cannot sit silent. 
I'm opposed to the president's plan for escalation, and as such, I fully support this resolution. The president's own military commanders and experts have advised against this course of action. In his testimony, General John Abizade stated before the Armed Service Committee in November of 2006, less than three months ago, quote, I do not believe that more American troops right now is the solution to the problem, end quote. My constituents and the American people have also made their position known. In November, my constituents and people across this nation voted for a change in direction in Iraq. The plan to escalate is directly contradictory to that call for change. The escalation plan takes us further down the wrong path, getting us in deeper and deeper with a policy that asks our military to accomplish the non-military mission of creating a viable unified government in Iraq. But unity in Iraq has to be determined by the people who live there. And the evidence is overwhelming that what our troops are being asked to fix is a sectarian civil war. The independent bipartisan Iraq Study Commission, whose advice the president sought, after careful consideration concluded Iraq is in a civil war. Our nation has paid a high price to provide the people of Iraq with the opportunity to support a unified government. The lives of over 3,000 American troops have been lost, more than 47,000 civilian deaths, and $379 billion spent so far, with another $8 billion spent every month on this war. Those lives cannot be retrieved. Accountability and oversight require that we make our opposition to the President's plan known. 138 brave men and women from the state of Ohio have been killed in this war thus far, 14 from my district. I have a responsibility to every one of those casualties and to everyone that might lie ahead, and I am here representing their voices, especially those that can no longer be heard. In the face of evidence demonstrating a military solution is not the solution needed in Iraq, it's time to change direction. The President's plan represents more of the same. We must not send more military troops to address a situation that does not have a military solution. That is how we support the troops. It's not fair or just to do otherwise. In my district, there's a man by the name of Paul Schroeder, an early August of 2005, he lost his son, Lance Corporal Edward Augie Schroeder II, to the Iraq War. He and 13 other young wives from Northeast Ohio were lost that day. In 2006, in January, Paul Schroeder shared his thoughts and feelings in a letter printed in the Washington Post, <coughs> entitled, quote, A Life Wasted. His letter included the following words. Since August, we have witnessed growing opposition to the Iraq War, but it's often whispered hands covering mouths, as if it's too dangerous to speak too loudly. Others discuss the never-ending cycle of death in places such as Haditha in academic and sometimes clinical fashion, as in, quote, the increasing lethality of improvised explosive devices, end quote. Wiping the clinical talk away, Paul Schroeder went on in his letter and shared the painful reality that he and his family had to face, a re reality that can be understood cannot be understood when sanitized by technical or clinical terms. He said, listen to the kinds of things that most Americans don't have to experience. The day Augie's unit returned from Iraq to Camp Lejeune, we received a box with his notebooks, DVDs, and clothes from his locker in Iraq. The day his unit returned from home to waiting families, we received the second urn of ashes. This lad of promise, of easy charm, and readiness to help, whose highest high was saving someone using CPR as a first aid squad volunteer, came home in one coffin and two urns. We buried him in three places that he loved. A fitting irony, I suppose, but just as rough each time. The growing opposition to the war in Iraq must not be whispered, hands covering mouths, as if it's too dangerous to speak too loudly. Accountability and oversight require more. This resolution rings loud and clear. We support our troops, and we oppose the president's plan to escalate our troops in Iraq. Will the president hear our collective voice? If he does not, it will not be because we sat silent. Thank you very much, Ms. Sutton. And now I'm delighted to invite to uh, the table 
the authors of this resolution, H. Conrad 63, Chairman Skelton, Chairman Lantos, and Mr. Jones. And without objection, your full statements can appear in the record, or you may read them as you choose. Delighted to have you. You can decide the order of speech, if you like. Be sure to turn the microphones on, please. Madam Chairman, uh, Mr. Dreyer, Ranking Member, <clears throat> I appreciate the opportunity to testify this evening asking for a rule on H. Conrad 63, and I'm pleased to <coughs> have Tom Lantos, California, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee and longtime member of the Armed Services Committee, Walter Jones, North Carolina, to join me. So I do ask for a rule <clears throat> on this simple resolution that expresses strong support for our troops and expresses disapproval of the plan to increase the number of troops that are presently deployed. It'd be easiest, Madam Chairman, for those of us at this table to adopt the eloquence of the members of this committee. As I was listening to each of you speak, I looked around the walls and saw the portraits of four members of Congress that I, with whom I have served and each has served as chairman of this committee. And over on my right behind Ms. Castor is the portrait of Richard Bowling of Kansas City, who was a member of Congress when our distinguished ranking member, Mr. Dreyer, was a boy in that fair city. And I wonder what he would think about this issue and about this debate tonight. And I remember so often he urged to do what was right. And I think the resolution before us is straightforward and gives us the opportunity to do what is right. A friend from Texas, Mr. Sessions, says the status quo was what we're fighting against. He's absolutely right. It's the status quo that we're fighting against. We were promised, Madam Chairman, we were promised a change in strategy. What we received was a change in tactics. And those of us that serve on the Armed Services Committee know full well the difference between the two. An escalation, actually a troop increase, calling for 21,500 more American troops, it doesn't end there. The Pentagon says we'll need at least 2,500 more support troops Congressional Budget Office says we'll need between 13,000 and 28,000 more support troops. And it's not the status quo, but that's what we're receiving. I feel very strongly about this, Madam Chairman, because in September 2002, in March of 2003, I advised the administration of the ragged edge of the upcoming <clears throat> conflict. Sadly, my letters have been proven to be prophetic. We have a very ragged edge now some four years later. The cost of American lives, injuries, and treasure. Through those years, we have continued the status quo, and the only thing that we could have hoped for was a change in strategy, which this is not. So without going into great detail, Madam Chairwoman, I urge that this resolution receive a rule. We have the opportunity to extensively speak on it 
and debate it. And as we stand in the shoes of our American constituents, neighbors, I hope that everyone's voice will be heard on this and at the end of the day, we'll have the opportunity to say yes, we support those wonderful troops and no, this tactic is not a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lantos? With your permission, I yield. Of course, Mr. Jones. Be happy to hear you. Madam Chairman, thank you, and I'll be fairly brief. I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to speak about this resolution, uh, 63. I, I'm of the firm belief that it needs to stand alone. Quite frankly, we do not need to be debating other issues at this time. I hope we will in the future, to be honest about it. But <clears throat> I am of the firm belief that the American people spoke in November. As a Republican, I'm now in the minority. And I think the largest percentage of the people that voted to put you in the majority were speaking out against the war in Iraq, quite frankly. And the American people spoke, and I accept their decision. When I think about the fact that we are asking 20-some thousand Americans to be referees, referees in a civil war, where the Shias hate the Sunnis and the Sunnis hate the Shias. And I have been, like my friends have mentioned earlier tonight, I have been to Walter Reed numerous times. I've been to Bethesda numerous times. A couple other points, and then I'll, I'll work toward a close. I will never forget six months ago, Gene Taylor and I went to Walter Reed. We went into the room of a sergeant, I didn't know it at the time, from Florida. His fiance was at the end of his bed. His mom and dad were in the same room. We <coughs> met him. The mother had tears coming out of her eyes, understandably. Gene and I go up, as all members of Congress do. We thank them for their service, for being the hero, true heroes, not the basketball players or football, but for soldiers and the Marines and, and all. And I know we'll forget, he said um, he'd been to Iraq three times. He said, Congressman, I know my opinion doesn't matter. You know, how does that really make you feel? When a soldier says, who served this nation, my opinion doesn't matter. But he said that not to be malice, but just making a point. We said, oh, yes, sir, your opinion matters so much. And you know Gene Taylor. He's as, as emotional as I am from time to time. He said, I've been there three times. He said, Congressman, you're never going to change the people. He said, I won't be going back. He pulled the sheets back, and both his legs were gone. And what can you say when you see a man or woman who's lost their legs, but thank you? And that is so, so insignificant, but thank you. If I had known four years ago what I know today, and after seeing that report that came out on Douglas Fife and how the Office of Special Plans manipulated the intelligence to sell us a bill of goods to commit our troops to Iraq. I hope that is not the end of it, and I'll leave Mr. Fife at that. When I think about the fact that you have General Abbasade, as was mentioned earlier, General Colin Powell, Jay Gardner, General Hoare, uh, Odom, uh, McCaffrey, all of these generals are saying no to the surge. No to the surge. This is just one more example of a failed policy, quite frankly. And I regret that I have to say that, but it's the way that I feel. And Madam Speaker, Madam Chairman, excuse me, as I begin to close tonight, Sam Johnson is a hero of this country. There's also another one that will be speaking, Wayne Gilchrist. He's a humble man, just like Sam Johnson. Wayne was a Marine in Vietnam who was wounded. I've been to Walter Reed with him before. And Wayne did not want to go the first time because he said to me, he said, Walter, I've not been back since I was in the hospital myself recovering from my wounds in Vietnam. So tonight, I'm pleased to be here with Chairman Lantos, my Chairman Skelton, who I have great respect for both. And I have great respect for everybody on this panel here tonight. I do, the freshmen as well. 
but I will say tonight that the American people, in mid-January, 70% of the American people said no to the surge, no. So whether tonight, if you approve the rule for HCON 63, then allow the debate to be on this alone, I think you'll be doing the right thing. And I think down the road, you can bring other issues up. But the American people are opposed to this war in Iraq. They're opposed to the surge. And I just thank you for letting me be a small part of this panel tonight. Mr. Jones, in addition to Mr. Gilchrist, Mr. Johnson, and the wonderful service they had, we thank you for yours. You're a hero to many of us. Karen, thank you. Congressman Lantos. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, Ranking Member Dreyer, members of the committee. As I look around this room, Madam Chair, I am probably the only person who was a participant in the Second World War, mm -hmm. during the course of which 55 million human beings lost their lives. So I don't come to a discussion of a war lightheartedly. Let me just say at the outset that the Foreign Affairs Committee, in the few weeks we have had so far in this session, held hearings on Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, North Korea, Darfur, and a number of other subjects. We have heard from Secretary Rice twice, from Secretary Albright, from our former colleague, my predecessor, Chairman Hamilton, and scores of others. The escalation has been debated endlessly, both in the Senate and in think tanks around town. We have all the information we could possibly need. Madam Chairwoman, our resolution is both simple and straightforward. If you are for escalation, you will vote against our resolution. And if you are against escalation, as I am, you will vote for it. This is a historic debate we will have beginning tomorrow. Every single member of the House will have his time to make his point. I urge the committee to give every member five minutes to express his judgment on this important issue. This is the beginning of our debate, not the end of it. We will have plenty of opportunities to debate many aspects of this war. Early in March, Madam Chairwoman, I have scheduled a full hearing of the Foreign Affairs Committee where every member who has legislation relating to the Iraq war will have an opportunity to present his plan for a discussion and a debate. This war fails the first rule of war. It does not require shared sacrifice. Very early on in this war, in a closed session, one of the highest ranking members of this administration before, a, appeared before our committee. And I asked him point blank, how can we proceed without shared sacrifice? I got no satisfactory answer. And I've had no satisfactory answer ever since. Saddam Hussein is gone. There are no weapons of mass destruction. And the United States has global responsibilities. As chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, one of the worst nightmares I have is the extent to which we have failed to address our many and complex global responsibilities. There is a single-minded fixation on this war, which will result in enormous detriment to our foreign policy. It has already very seriously impacted our military. 
Madam Chair, you cannot unscramble an omelet. I am one of those members who visited Iraq among the very first groups that went there in early, 50, in early 2003. I had the privilege of sitting with General Petraeus, no finer leader could you find, in his helicopter, traveling over much of northern Iraq. And he pointed out to me huge arms depots that he had no soldiers to guard because he did not have adequate forces. I am not here to recite the long list of horrendous mistakes that were committed in the conduct of this war. And the notion that at this stage, with the American people and by the end of the week, the Congress of the United States again expressing their view that what we need to do is to change course, not to accelerate our pace on the present course, will be clear for all to see. I strongly urge you to uh, approve this uh, proposal. Uh, its simplicity it's one of, is one of its greatest virtues. We saw in the other body complex, multi-page, nuanced resolutions leading to nowhere, leading to worse than nowhere, leading to embarrassment. This is the opportunity for the House of Representatives to demonstrate where the American people stand. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I, I don't have questions for you because, I, as you point out, what we're doing is quite simple here and evident. Only one thing, uh, Mr. Jones made it very clear that he thinks this resolution by itself is quite enough. Uh, I, I need to ask both you and Chairman Skelton if you agree. I certainly do. Chairman Skelton. You bet, yes. Thank you for your extraordinarily hard work, and I think this, the government and the country will stand very much in stead, Mr. Dreyer. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I, uh, I'm going to forego any questions myself because we all obviously have, have discussed this. I have the greatest respect for all three of our colleagues on this panel, as they well know. And uh, I'd just like to state for the record, I hope that we can move ahead. We've been here for, for quite a while. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, our colleague Sam Johnson today marks the 34th anniversary of um, his return uh, being released from a prisoner of war camp. And I've been told that he, at this moment, is missing a dinner, uh, which is commemorating that. And so um, I don't want to do anything that would, in a way, uh, keep him from that. And so I hope that he'll be able to come forward just as quickly as possible. And thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Anyone here? Then let's excuse this panel with our thanks. Thank and we will, we will call up Mr. Johnson. We don't want him to miss his dinner. Please come up, Mr. Johnson. For the benefit of the new members who don't know Mr. Johnson, he spent, I think it was 10 years, is that correct? Seven years. Ago. Seven years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Um, five years? How, Sam, how long were you a prisoner? Seven years. Seven years. Uh, which must have seemed to you like 14 or 50 or more. Uh, we are deeply in your debt, Mr. Johnson, for, for what you s persevered and came back home to us, for which we're very glad. So you're welcome to summarize your statement or... Uh, Madam Chairman, I appreciate that. Have you checked it with a parliamentarian? Is it germane? Ma'am? Yes. Is it germane? Yes. All right. It's an amendment, and uh, I hope you'll consider it sometime. I, uh, and interesting discussion tonight. I appreciate all y'all's attention and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're perceptive and I can recognize the differences in opinion. As you know, we have them. They're serious in this Congress. Uh, but I'd like to uh, uh, remind you, if I can, that uh, this is going to be a long, drawn-out war. We're not going to get it over in two days. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, <clears throat> apparently the uh, 
terrorism that's going on around the world is something we need to watch out for and be able to protect not just the forces in Iraq, but the United States of America. And, you know, there are some people who say it could be another drawn out as long as 50 years, and most of them don't go away in less than 10. I believe Congress has a responsibility to support and protect our troops in harm's way. I mean, put yourselves in the shoes of the men and women fighting to bring freedom and democracy to Iraq. It just so happens, uh, as David uh, Dreyer pointed out, that in 73, I finally got to leave Hanoi. And as a former POW, more than half of that seven years was in solitary confinement, I know the proposed resolution would undermine the morale of our troops. The resolution's the first step in your plan, I believe, to cut off funding for the American troops in harm's way. And if y'all are serious about supporting our troops, <coughs> you would allow Republicans to offer my amendment as an alternative that ensures Congress never wavers in our commitment to fund the American men and women in uniform protecting our freedom. Recently, NBC Nightly News ran a story on what the troops on the ground in Iraq think. They think about all this debate in Washington opposing the troop surge. <clears throat> I'll close with the gist of what he said. He said, you can't support the troops and oppose the war. You just can't have it both ways. I hope you'll include my amendment uh, in the debate. The troops need to know that the United States Congress is behind them 110%. And I... Uh, uh, just remind you that we made the mistake in Vietnam of pulling out, cutting the funding. That's not what you're trying to do right now, but this is a step <coughs> in that direction. And we had that one. And my memory of guys hanging from helicopters in the last days in Vietnam uh, when we pulled out is just something that I can't erase. I was over there early uh, this past year and uh, laid a wreath on the memorial in front of the old U.S. Embassy for the Marines and the embassy people that were killed in that last days. And it brought tears to my eyes thinking that the United States Congress let them down. So uh, for America, Please make this amendment in order. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, we, we I think, have all sworn in the first part of this resolution is that we will not do anything to hurt our, our soldiers in, uh, in harm's way, even the ones who are there now and the ones who have been there. Uh, Mr. Dreyer? Uh, Madam Chairman, I will simply say uh, thank you uh, very much to uh, our colleague Sam Johnson. Uh, you can't help but have amazing reference for uh, the gentleman and his service to the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, in light of his words, I clearly am uh, very supportive of his effort to uh, allow his resolution to be considered. And if this committee does choose to make it in order, I will be an enthusiastic champion of it on the House floor as we continue this struggle for freedom. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. McGough. I have no questions. I want to thank you for being here and thank you for your service to the Congress. And um, and, um, and again, I would just echo what uh, our chairwoman has said, that, uh, that the resolution that was, has been brought before the um, Rules Committee today by Mr. Skelton, Mr. Landhost, and Mr. Mr. Jones makes it unequivocally clear of our support uh, for our troops. So I appreciate very much your appearance here. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, simply want to reiterate my admiration for the great American hero, Sam Johnson, especially on this day. Uh, so special. Um, and, um, and, and reiterate also that he has expressed, uh, in, I, in what I consider to such a, a, an important manner, the wisdom of his experience. this evening to us. And I think it's 
important, important that we absorb the experience of his wisdom uh, and uh, what he has said about history and the parallels of history. So, uh, uh, Sam, thank you. Uh, I certainly support uh, your uh, um, substitute. Hope that it's made in order. Uh, and uh, its points, I think, need to be reiterated, uh, not only tomorrow, but in the months ahead and years ahead. Does anyone else wish to comment on either side? Yeah, thank you very Sorry. much. And, and Sam, I want to uh, thank you very much for your work on the substitute amendment. But just to, to make a point that Mr. diaz Villart made in his initial statement, and you reiterated just briefly about the signal that this sends uh, overseas. And you experienced that when you were a, you were a POW, and you, you glossed over it very lightly. I would just recommend to my colleagues that you read uh, Mr. Uh, or, uh, Sam's book of his experiences there, because he goes into a little bit more, much more detail on this particular point than what we, uh, what we I probably don't fully understand. So Sam, I, I appreciate very much your bringing forward the substitute. I certainly uh, support it. And, uh, and I think you make a, a, a very, very uh, good point. And I thank you for your service. Okay, Mr. Sessions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Congressman Johnson, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. And I appreciate the opportunity to we had a uh, number of brave people who testified to see the leaders on the list ahead of me. I recall a story that was done in the group that was saying it was so true. During the Vietnam War, a group of wives came to Capitol Hill. They came to Capitol Hill to meet members of the Senate, members of the House. And the story was only one person could meet all the wives. That was in the Bob Bell. Tonight, Thank Johnson. you. I appreciate uh, each and every we... one of you, and I salute you all. Oh, uh, no, Mr. we salute you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you nice for dinner. your service. And Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Indeed. Our next panel, would maybe you all would like to come up together uh, with Mr. Gilchrist, Mr. Wolf, and Mr. Pence. And I understand Mr. Shays is on his way to join you. So when he gets here, we can, uh, we can let him in. Um, I think we can start, I believe, next in line was... Uh, <coughs> Mr. Pence, I think you, you're first. Good. Pull a chair on up to the table, Frank. Don't you all, you, you all would rather go singly? Okay. Oh, sure. I was just wondering if all of you would like to come to the table at the same time and speak sure. together, and then we could ask questions of each of you. I'll be brief. But the first question we need to know from all of you is, have you, have you checked with the parliamentarian 
uh, as to the germaneness of your amendments. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay. Everybody has. Okay. Yes. Mr. Gilchrist, you've no. checked to be germane. No. You're with Frank. No. All right. Okay. All right. Welcome, Mr. Shays. Let's uh, start with Mr. Pence, if we may. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, <coughs> Madam Chairwoman. And I would ask uh, unanimous consent to submit my statement in its entirety to the record. We'd be happy to have you do that. Uh, I'm honored to appear before you today on behalf of um, of uh, two amendments that, that uh, in, in, in substance, represent uh, the same uh, proposal uh, for the committee. I, this is my first opportunity to speak before the committee uh, as newly constituted. I would commend the chairwoman for the dignity of these proceedings. Thank you very much. Uh, and the ranking member. welcome. Uh, happy to have you. Although I, I must say I did like the committee better before. Uh, uh, let, let me say, uh, uh, before I explain my amendments, uh, just very quickly, I, I would like to um, say emphatically that I, I am uh, a strong supporter of the President's uh, a call for a troop surge in Iraq, uh, although I was uh, not quick to come to that conclusion. Uh, my skepticism was derived from uh, four different trips into Iraq, and on each of those occasions I heard from our military commanders on the ground that a large American footprint uh, in Iraq was counterproductive to our long-term interests there. But when I met with the President in January at, at the White House, um, what I heard the President uh, describe was not just more troops for more troops' sake, uh, but as I, I believe my colleagues will present on the floor this week. Um, those of us who will be opposing uh, the majority's uh, 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 base resolution. Uh, that, that I, I think what the President is proposing is a new strategy, new rules of engagement, new tactics. It is truly a new way forward that is designed to work with Iraqis in the lead to quell violence in Baghdad and establish the conditions for a long-term political solutions. As some of my colleagues with their proposals may reflect momentarily more eloquently than me, uh, this course approach was first recommended by the Iraq study group uh, that, uh, that recommended uh, that they could support a short-term increase in military uh, in Baghdad to quell violence. And I, I would endorse that recommendation of the Iraq study group in my comments today. Uh, that, that what changed my mind, of course, is, is the summer of 2006 and the advent of an extraordinary level of violence and the changing conditions on the ground. And, uh, and therefore, I strongly support the President's call for troop surge. Now, this brings me to my uh, uh, proposal uh, for amendments to the concurrent resolution before us. While I cannot support the resolution for the reasons that I stated, uh, I do believe that your, the majority's resolution can be improved by my substitute amendments or by the amendments being offered by my colleagues and particularly Mr. Johnson just discussed. My amendments puts forth a deference to the President as Commander in Chief, uh, and it, but it specifically puts forward uh, Congress's support for the troops by calling on this Congress to commit not to reduce or eliminate funding to our troops. Uh, I, I commend the majority for the language in the proposed resolution that speaks of support for the troops, but I think it's imperative that we go one step further in this moment uh, while we attempt to speak on behalf of the American people in this well of Congress and we give members of this body an opportunity to vote to, uh, and to commit uh, not to reduce or eliminate funding to our troops in Iraq. Um, and let me, let me speak to the significance of this. My, my amendment is in the nature of a substitute is nearly identical uh, to the concurrent resolution offered in the Senate uh, by my colleague Senator Judd Gregg in New Hampshire. Uh, he set forth support for the troops and called on Congress not to eliminate or reduce funding for our troops in Iraq. Uh, by some press accounts, Madam Chairwoman, uh, uh, the Gregg resolution in the Senate would have garnered some 70 votes, an extraordinary bipartisan statement. I would also note for the record that Senator Gregg's resolution and my substitute amendment contain language nearly identical to language contained in S-470, which is a bill authored uh, by Senator Levin, which calls on Congress not to eliminate or reduce funds for troops in the field. Now, this can be found on page 8, lines 7 through 13 of S-470. Uh, if this 
call not to cut funds for the troops is good enough for the leading Democrat on this issue in the Senate, then I would urge this committee to consider uh, the Pence Amendment uh, in, and to uh, give members of, of their party and, uh, and members of this body the opportunity to also consider what in the Senate is clearly a bipartisan uh, position. I believe each member should be granted the opportunity to cast an up or down vote on support for funding the troops in Iraq. Let me close by saying, Confucius once said that when words lose their meaning, men lose their liberty. And let me say, um, uh, with great moral seriousness, in this case, it also may mean their lives. And the truth is, there, there is a fundamental difference between a Congress that is willing to commit in the broadest terms to support our troops in Iraq and a Congress that is willing, while it advocates a different course than the Commander-in-Chief, a Congress that is willing to say emphatically that they will not vote to reduce or eliminate funding to those forces. I believe there is a specious distinction between the proposal Mr. Johnson brings forward, the Gregg Resolution as manifested in the Pence Amendment, and I urge its, uh, its consideration. I think it's absolutely imperative uh, that members of Congress be given the opportunity to publicly commit uh, to take no action to reduce or eliminate funding of our troops in Iraq and uh, yield the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Pence. Mr. Wolf? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, uh, I beg the committee to give us an opportunity to vote on the Iraq study group. Uh, last year, I offered this amendment. I heard people complain that there was no oversight. Mm -hmm. and. We asked the group to pull together 10 people who love their country more than they love their political party. It is a bipartisan effort. Jim Baker, Secretary of State. Lee Hamilton, who was uh, head of uh, foreign affairs. I think he was also chairman of the Intel Committee, uh, co-chairman of 9-11. Leon Panetta, who served <coughs> in this house uh, for a long, long period of time. Others, Sandra Day O'Connor, Chuck Robb, who served in combat. It is a, it is a, uh, this says on the, it's a way forward and it is a new, new approach. Just to read you two paragraphs from here, it said, our political leaders must build a bipartisan approach to bring a responsible conclusion to what is now a lengthy and costly war. Our country deserves a debate that prizes substance over rhetoric and a policy that is adequately funded and sustainable. The President and the Congress must work together. When our country is divided, we are weak, and that's what I saw last year. And those of you who were here last year voted for this. This was in the supplemental. When our nation is divided, we are, we are, we are weak. Our leaders must be candid and forthright with the American people in order to win that support. And in the conclusion, it said, it is the unanimous view of the Iraq Study Group that these recommendations offer a new way forward the United States and Iraq in the region. They are comprehensive. And this is the only comprehensive resolution that's out there. They are comprehensive and need to be implemented in a coordinated fashion. They should not be separated or carried out in isolation. The dynamics of the region are important to Iraq as events within Iraq. It also calls for a surge, if you will, diplomatically, the same way that Ronald Reagan, when he was calling for the Soviet Union to tear down the wall, in essence, we're sending envoys with regard to the Soviet Union to engage. When he gave the speech where he called the Soviet Union the evil empire, he was still dealing with that. So this is the only one, and in the words of Jim Baker and Lee Hamilton, the way forward and a new approach. I beg you. I mean, you're going to get your resolution. You hopefully get Pence, and the others will give him, and Sam Johnson. But this is a comprehensive plan. And I got criticized from both sides of the aisle. The administration doesn't completely support this, and your side doesn't completely support it. Two or three of you mentioned this. I watched the hearing last week where Lee Hamilton and Jim Baker testified over the Senate. Every senator, Republican and Democrat, said they supported the Iraq Study Group. Please, on behalf, forget me, I'm irrelevant. On behalf of the American people, Give us a vote. Give them a vote on this to offer a comprehensive plan whereby we can be successful. Mr. Gale, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm, I'm here to, um, first of all, I want to say up front that I'm going to vote for your, re your resolution that's on the floor this week. I think it's a positive step in the right direction. It's important for but I am also here supporting uh, what my colleague, 
uh, Frank Wolf is doing with his resolution, which basically deals with the Iraq Study Group recommendations. In this conflict, we know that the United States needs a strong military. And we have a strong military, as best as we can have under the circumstances. We need good intelligence uh, and the kind of information gathering. This is in the Iraq Study Group. They talk about troop deployment. They talk about a framework upon which our troops will work with the Iraqi troops, a framework upon which our government works with the Iraqi government. They, they talk about consultation with Congress. In my view, what is missing in this whole issue is we're too focused on Iraq. The Iraq study group, as Frank described, has a diplomatic initi initiative attached to it, a comprehensive diplomatic initiative. Now, many of us in this room lived through the day that Nikita Khrushchev pounded his shoe on the podium at the United Nations, pointed at the Western diplomats, including Henry, Henry Cabot Lodge, and said, we will bury you. Eisenhower's response invited Khrushchev to the United States. We remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Deployable armed nuclear warheads in Cuba, 90 miles <coughs> away. What are we going to do? We, we, we began a dialogue. China was the same, same way. Nixon went to China. What was the only period of time in that historic period of time that we didn't have a dialogue? It was in a weak Southeast Asian country that people never heard of before, and it was with Ho Chi Minh. But I, I do have to say, having been there 40 years ago, and I respect Sam Johnson. I know the time he spent there, the difficulties he had. I was a young 20-year-old sergeant. Mm -hmm. There were 500,000 troops in an area half the size of Iraq. We dropped more explosive power than all the bombs World War I, World War II, Korea combined in one 11-day period in the latter part of the war on Hanoi and Haiphong. We dropped more explosive power than the combined explosive power of both atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And I can tell you, when I got there in July of 66, I remember Robert McNamara saying in the Stars and Stripes newspaper that we had that major combat operations will be over in six months. And a few months later, we realized on the ground that that was not the case. And we wanted people in the states, in the Congress, to know what we knew on the ground. Dialogue, a comprehensive, integrated, diplomatic effort with all of Iraq's neighbors includes Iraq and Syria, which are key players we should never fear negotiating, having a dialogue with a weaker nation. And so I'm going to support this resolution, because I don't think, in my own experience, this will have a negative effect on the average soldier, because they know what's going on. This is going to have a positive effect on the American people, on the people in Iraq, because it says, OK, fellas, you better get your act together, and the international community. So um, I would urge that this week, or very soon, that a resolution that puts out the kind of information that the Iraq Study Group has be put on the floor for a vote. And I'd just like to, with all the discussions that I've heard here tonight, it's been magnificent. There's a book called The Ascent of Man, about 35 years old, written by Jacob Bernowski, a Polish Jew that left Europe in a flight so he wouldn't be caught up in Auschwitz. He talks about World War II. And this is his quote. There are two parts to the human dilemma. One is the belief that the end justifies the means. That push-button philosophy, that deliberate deafness to human suffering that has become the monster in the war machine. The other is betrayal of the human spirit, where a nation becomes a regiment of ghosts, obedient ghosts, or tortured ghosts. And that's what we have here. Does each of us independently think about the kinds of issues that are so vital for us to deal with and debate. Um, so I, I welcome this debate and this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilchrist. Mr. Shays? I'm really grateful you're having this hearing, and I'm grateful that all of you are here. Thank you. Specialist Perez, Specialist Avery Felder,
Corporal Dempsey, Private Medeiros, they all came home to their parents, but draped in American flags. And I think about them almost every day, as do all of you, because that's how personal it is. I've had 99 hearings on terrorism since September 11th, actually 20 before, and 14 of them on Iraq, and I've had 15 trips to Iraq, uh, some with my colleague, Mr. Wolf, and four of those times outside the umbrella of the military. And I, I plead on you not to give up on Iraq and the Iraqis. They didn't attack us, we attacked them. And I feel like we basically performed open heart surgery and before the job is done, we're leaving them. And I could never live with that. Now, they can decide that they don't want us uh, by telling us we'll leave or by their actions or lack of actions. I'm here to support Frank Wolf's substitute supporting the Iraqi study group. I'm here to thank him personally. I knew he was here and I wanted to personally thank him for doing that. He took that initiative on his own and then asked some of us to sponsor it. We went into Iraq on a bipartisan basis. We did. We may have made a mistake, but we did it on a bipartisan basis. This helps us get out of Iraq on a bipartisan basis. This is a capability to unite us. And I understand that you may choose not to have <coughs> any rule to have this be a closed debate. Um, and you can say, and rightfully so, that we did it to you. But the fact is we lost the election. And we didn't just lose the election because we went into Iraq. We went on, lost this election on how we conducted ourselves. Give us an opportunity to show Americans that we can be bipartisan. This proposal says replace Americans with Iraqis. The administration is doing that, and they're trying to speed that up. It says get Sias and Sunnis to sit down and work out their differences on oil, on federalism, on debathification, a host of other issues. And if they don't, the study group says there will be consequences. The consequences are if they can't work out their differences, then we'll leave. There will be consequences. And the third thing it says is a diplomatic dialogue in the neighborhood, including Syria and including Iran. That's what it says. And in my judgment, uh, this administration hasn't done what it should in that area. What an incredible message of proaction you would be telling this administration. Move forward with the replacement of Iraqis, Americans with Iraqis. Move forward with forcing action on Sunni Shia compromise, move forward on a diplomatic action. That is proactive. What I think you're doing with this resolution, and this is where my colleague and I differ, though I say it humbly because on the back of this man's back is a bullet hole. Mm -hmm. um, he had a bullet that went in his whole rib cage and came out the, the ba his back. He was left on the battlefield for three hours, and he doesn't talk about it, but that's what he brings to this dialogue. So I am very humble when I say that I don't think that this resolution moves anything forward because it says what you don't want to do. It doesn't say what you want. And what you're left with when this resolution passes is the status quo. And I just, I'll end by saying this. I think Congress should be very clear. If you don't think we should be there, let's have a resolution that says get out. But I think when we start to micromanage the war, then I think we are doing what a commander in chief should do. I think you don't want 20,000 more folks potentially in Baghdad. And I'm thinking, what about the troops that are still going to have to carry out the mission with 20,000 less people? They're still going to do the mission. They'll have 20,000 less, courtesy of what we say. So um, please give us an opportunity to debate this. It's bipartisan, and I think it's constructive. And I thank you, Mr. Wolf. I thank all four of you for very thoughtful work and certainly the fact that uh, we have a lot of respect for all four of you. Um, the three of you have all worked in such a great bipartisan way for which we're very grateful. And I, I want to make it clear that I, I don't think there's a sub person on my side who doesn't believe very strongly in the study group report. Uh, and we've said that over and over again. We want to, uh, you know, to make sure that uh, the, the things that they have recommended get a good hearing here, they never have. And I, I think we'll, you'll be pleased to see that we are going to do that. This is simply the first step. There are so many things we have to do here. 
I think one of the things that, that certainly disturbs my constituents, and I think I can speak for everybody, is the over-deployment of these troops. I had a call from a father last week whose son is going for the fourth time. And he literally asked me, are they going to make him go until he's killed? I mean, there's the anguish that people feel that sending them back third and fourth times, many of them not regular military, but the Guard and Reserve, uh, has set a pattern that we've never followed before in this country. So many things have happened that we have never done before and I hope we'll never do again. Uh, mistakes are legion. I know we understand we've already had 52 oversight hearings. And one of the things, Mr. Pence, I know you would care about uh, when we talk about the money for the troops, we all want the money for the troops, but we're not that crazy about the money for Halliburton. We all noticed that five people were indicted just last week for hauling off a lot of the money that we sent over with no oversight. These are things that before we're through with this issue, we want to really try to understand what happened here. I mean, did we over-privatize? What have we done? Why can't we have lights on in Iraq after four years? How come they don't have running water? What's been going on? We have no, those oversight hearings have not been held, and we want to make sure we do that. We are delighted that we want it to be bipartisan. We want you to work with us. We're happy with what everything has happened this year up to now, and the good, strong bipartisan vote. We, we want to work together. We said that from the outside. We believe that you here represent the same number of people that we do, and you speak for them. Uh, so, but this resolution tonight is very close, very well constructed, <coughs> making the statement that we need to make because we all promised our constituents we were going to make it. And we respectfully ask you to join us on it. And it simply says that we will not abandon anybody in the field or anyone who has been there. And second, that we do not approve of this escalation. We've had three before that didn't do a thing in the world. They just got lost in that morass. Uh, so that we ask you to be patient with us on other things that we're going to do. We welcome your input. We welcome the conversations with you and working with you on those things. But, and I appreciate so much your coming tonight. It, I don't you, have any questions for you, certainly. Yeah, I just, one of the things we asked was, we said, let's have a new Secretary of Defense, and we got, mm -hmm. yeah. we said, let's have a new team in Iraq, and we have it with Mr. Petraeus, and every one of us who's been to Iraq knows he's the best man for the job. We do believe that. And we asked for a new plan. And so I'm, I'm but left with But we didn't get that. Well, I think a plan that says, instead of just going into an area, we hold the area, and we hold the area and rebuild it, is a new plan. But you know most of the military people I've talked to, Mr. Shays, who said that, that was the most elemental thing in the military. You take territory and you hold it, and it's, they seem quite surprised that after four years that we have come to the conclusion well, we agree we on that. To do that. It couldn't have taken so long. Uh, but it, um, we, you know, we don't need to go into all that tonight. I think we've all made it pretty clear uh, that we not only feel, uh, most of us, I think, who were here at the time voted against the war. Um, I took general's advice myself. I remember most of them saying that very day before we had the vote, that this was the wrong war, the wrong time, and the wrong man. Uh, and I knew they knew more about it than I did. Mr. Wolf, you were I may say, though, this is the only comprehensive plan <coughs> that is before the Congress that gives us an opportunity yes. to be successful. And we respectfully ask, your resolution's fine, whoever else fine, we ask respectfully. And each and every day that we postpone the opportunity to deal with this, we bring about a more ripping apart of the country. So all the resolutions out there are fine. This is the only, Baker and Hamilton poured their blood out on this. As did this all is the answer. This is part of the solution to bring the country together. It cannot wait. This is like <coughs> 37 to 38 in Nazi Germany coming. We cannot wait for other months and other times and other things. Take your vote and take it, but give us a vote on this one here, because this is the one that provides an opportunity to heal the country, to bring the country. If Lee Hamilton and Jim Baker can sit together, if Vernon Jordan and Ed Meese, Ed Meese's son will be one of the, the young colonels over there with General Petraeus, this offers us an opportunity for success. And I respectfully ask you, don't postpone it. You give us a vote. And we'll sit with you any time. The problem that we've got here, and I hate to mention up this esoteric process business, Mr. Pence is right, he's perfectly germane, but I'm afraid yours isn't. 
because we, it we far exceeds the scope of what we're doing in the resolution. <clears throat> but I say that with uh, saying again, reiterating to you again that we have great faith in what the Iraq study group did, and we are not, by no means through with that. That work should not go just into, onto the shelf. We understand that. Uh, and we, we will make sure and we give you a pledge that it isn't going to. Madam, Madam Chair? Of course, Mr. Cordoza. Thank you for yielding. I, I hate to go out of turn, but I really respect Mr. Wolf. I think he did a I great service by- We all do. Uh, mm -hmm. Exactly, by, by authoring this bill to create this commission. Mm -hmm. He helped me on the floor on a number of items. I would submit to Mr. Wolf and the others who so eloquently argued on his behalf that we're not rejecting his resolution at all. It was the president who didn't take the advice of that commission. Well, and, you know, I, I think that we can talk more about this, but it's already seemed to me that it's been rejected. Anybody else have a Mr. Ryan. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me begin by. Um, expressing my appreciation to Mr. Pence for his uh, very thoughtful proposal focusing specifically on ensuring that there is no reduction in funding for our troops, and I appreciate his comments on the other uh, proposals. Let me say, uh, too, that uh, I began uh, a discussion on this issue with Dr. David Abshire, uh, with whom Mr. Wolf worked very closely at the outset on the establishment of the Iraq Study Group, and I um, congratulate him and, and greatly appreciate this. I have to uh, take issue with uh, the words of my California colleague, Mr. Cardoza. If you listen to the testimony that was provided by these gentlemen, Mr. Shays especially began to outline the many, many aspects in the Iraq Study Group report that have already been implemented by President Bush. In fact, is it not true, Frank, that of the 79 <coughs> recommendations that 77 or so way up there have already been implemented by President Bush from the Iraq Study Group. I strongly support, I strongly support the work that you've done here. And as you know, I've spent time with uh, both Messrs. Baker and Hamilton and other members of this commission talking about their work. And uh, so for someone to in any way characterize that the administration has totally ignored this, we all know that the administration has had a disagreement on this whole notion of negotiating. And Wayne talked about it very well, negotiating with both Iran and Syria and others who may be involved. And the arguments of how we have in the past dealt with international challenges, well, we've worked militarily, we've also worked on the negotiating side, is a debate that is out there, and this administration is obviously not there at this point. But I do believe, uh, is it not true? That is true, and I believe that what we're saying is to pass this resolution on the floor, would send such a message. We, I even believe that the president and the administration should engage both Jim Baker and Lee Hamilton, because when you ask people who believe in something to do something, they generally can get it done. To engage them to come in and participate and be active in reaching out to the, well, I will say the that same it's... way, the same way, David, that President Reagan reached out. Yeah, absolutely, and we, 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 we've agreed on this. We've agreed on this notion, Frank. I just think that it's a mischaracterization. It, I, I think that it is a gross exaggeration for anyone to claim, and I know that it's been reported in the press, that the work of the Iraq Study Group has been cast as out of hand in the eyes of the administration. That is just plain Gentlemen wrong. Gentlemen, yield. And it is an inaccurate uh, characterization of exactly what has happened. The gentleman yield on that point. I, I wanted to share with all the members of the committee from the Iraq Study Group, page 73. Um, quote, we could, however, support a short-term redeployment or surge of American combat forces to stabilize Baghdad or to speed up the training and equipping mission if the U.S. commander in Iraq determines that such steps would be effective, close quote. General Betraeus, um, in his confirmation hearings, has confirmed that he thought the surge, the term of which comes from the Iraq study group, would be effective, hard, but effective. And I just wanted to support the gentleman's point that the Iraq Study Group's proposals have not been rejected out of hand. In fact, the surge itself, it can be argued, came from the recommendations of the Iraq Study Group. I yield back. And if I could just say, though, the gentleman, uh, Jim Baker, made it very clear. It's, it's, it's not like a fruit salad, though. 
that you can pick and, and choose. This is a comprehensive thing. In addition to what the gentleman said, also with regard to dealing on a diplomatic effort. And that, I think, makes all the difference. But I agree with the gentleman. Let me just, before, before the gentleman responds, uh, let, let, me, uh, let me just say that um, I, too, join in. I, I had no idea, Wayne, that, I mean, until Chris patted you on the back and talked about where that bullet had gone, I, you don't. Yeah, very gently. Did it hurt, by the way? I mean, you, you, you're smiling, so you said. But uh, I just wanted to express my appreciation, as I know to everyone else, for your amazing service. And you know of my reverence. My father was a drill instructor in the United States Marine Corps, and my great, great respect for, uh, for your service in the Marine Corps. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairman. Mr. Hastings, Florida. Chair, thank you very much. And I thank all of our colleagues uh, for their uh, presentation here. Chris, earlier today I was with uh, Henry Snyderman and Rick Lund and Jeff Hoffman and others from Connecticut from Hebrew Healthcare at a meeting down my way. And um, it's interesting, not those three persons, but many of the people that I spoke with today have a totally different view than all of us have expressed here this evening. It's interesting. Um, I, 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 I really, Frank, um, share your concerns, and I hope you heard the chair lady loud and clear uh, that the findings of the Iraq resolution and their uh, uh, Iraq uh, uh, committee and uh, those matters they put forward that are unattended at this point are not going to go by the wayside and hopefully uh, in another vehicle. Um, uh, the opportunity will present itself. But I appreciate your passion on the subject. I worked with Tim Roma before you introduced your legislation. And it was like pulling eye teeth to try to get the rest of the people around here to understand the need for that kind of ultimate determination as to what we should do. Tim Roma wound up on that Iraq study group. I just offer that uh, for bipartisan and other kind of consideration. But I do have a question, Madam Chair. Of Mr. Pence, and I ask for information because you may know I do not. Is there any example that you know of, my, where um, funds of, for of, of the military have been cut off during an active or hot war? Um, and I cite to um, Korea, Vietnam, the Second World War, however they ended, do you know of any example where uh, money for the military has been cut off while they were in harm's way? Uh, in response to the gentleman's question, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. My perception is that that did occur in some form or fashion during the Vietnam era. No, what happened in Vietnam was we decided to stop the war. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the cutoff measure uh, as proposed. If, if for example, um, all of you talked about uh, Sam, and I, I, I have as much admiration as any man or woman in the room uh, for Sam Johnson and his service. I also am personal friends with Pete Peterson that was a POW at the exact same time and served here with some of us in the United States House of Representatives. Um, and I even had the good fortune of going back to uh, Vietnam with Sam and uh, seeing how he reacted. Our new chair of the Intelligence Committee, Sylvester Reyes, was on that trip for the very first time. He had returned to Vietnam. Those are, are searing uh, memories for all of us. Uh, but my belief would be that if we were to follow Sam's or yours, Mike, and I think they're well thought out, um, um, amendments in the nature of a substitute, we could have war without end. Or uh, there must come a time, and I won't try to cite two scenarios because I don't want to spend too much time going back. I'd like for us to try to go forward <coughs> as fast as we can to get these people out of harm's way, our people and everybody. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, the arguments about micromanaging, uh, I see that as part of my job. If the commander in chief has gone off the deep end, and so I don't understand what it is that we are supposed to do. We could have someone that could just take us on down a path and never have an opportunity to do anything if we were to say what you are saying. I don't want to cut off any money for any troops. I'm mad that we didn't give them enough money to do the things that they needed to do in the first place. 
Uh, but I, I, I can't support um, uh, either yours or Sam's uh, substitutes for the reason that they are war without end. Hmm. Uh, there comes a time that we need to reread Eisenhower, don't we? And to understand the dynamics of defense. Uh, all of us talk, and with great hyperbole, uh, we carry on around here about support for the troops. Name me one member of Congress that's done, that does not support the United States military. I know of none. So we should dis just disband that argument because it carries out a false message out there. I can support this and be as active in supporting the troops as anybody in here. I've only been in Congress 14 years. Um, Wayne and Frank were here when I came here, as well as uh, 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 Chris. I believe Chris and I may have come around the same time. But every defense budget that we have had, I have supported. And I use me as a for example because I'm a dyed in the wool liberal. Okay, according to some of y'all. <laughs> but I voted for every defense budget, every supplemental, with the exception of one, and I'll tell you the reason I won't go into it now, every intelligence budget, I voted for it. And I'm a died in the wood liberal. So I don't want anybody in here to out support the troopers. Uh, that doesn't exist. Thank you, Madam Chair. I can uh, respond to the gentleman's uh, query. Um, let me be very clear. I, I think that it is completely within the Article I powers of the Congress of the United States to deny funding for military operations. I believe that's completely constitutional. It, there's nothing, and I can't speak entirely for Mr. Johnson's amendment, uh, but with regard to the Pence Amendment or the Gregg Amendment in the Senate that inspired it, um, our effort is simply to say, in this matter that we ought to be willing to commit publicly not to cut funding. Now, I would never presume upon the gentleman's voting card uh, or that of anyone in this room, but I, I, I stand for the proposition that I believe in my heart, as apparently, according to press accounts, is true in the Senate, that a majority of members of the House of Representatives today would like to make a declarative statement that they will not cut funding to the troops in Iraq, but maybe many of those same would be willing, as one of my colleagues here has expressed, would be willing to express a dissenting view on the Commander-in-Chief's proposal for a troop surge. Uh, I, the, the intent and purpose of the Pence Amendment in this case, and I think the Johnson Amendment, is an effort simply to give voice to those members of Congress who, in this instance, would like to take troop cuts off the table. Because let, let me say with great respect uh, to the chairman uh, and to all the members of the majority on this committee, uh, I have made it uh, a rule in my career never to question people's intentions or sincerity in this body. And I will not even imply that in this moment. But there are many people around the country who, seeing words like support uh, in resolutions, as opposed to the language that, that Democratic Senator Levin included in his resolution, that there would not be funding cuts, there are people around America who are concerned that what we will do this week is simply preamble for cutting funding for the troops in the field in Iraq. And I think that the Johnson Amendment and the Pence Amendment would be a way for the majority to let the Congress work its will on this issue and, and maybe produce a resolution that I, I would not support because the majority would likely oppose the surge, but it would, it would also <coughs> include a provision that said, in this matter, we will not exercise our Article I authority to cut funding. I agree clearly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Indeed. Indeed. Madam Mr. Gilchrist, you're Thank yours. you, Madam Chairman. I just want to make two very short comments, one about the Vietnam War and how it ended. The U.S. Congress did not cut funds to U.S. troops. It was a Vietnamization policy where the U.S. troops were drawn down and the Vietnamese, South Vietnamese Army replaced them, it, and it, it finalized itself in 1973. It wasn't for two years when Ford became president that the North Vietnamese reinvaded the South, and then President Ford, and I think justifiably so, did not get reengaged in that civil war. Now, the other the, the comment, I want to emphasize the comment that um, Mr. Wolf made about um, 
the Iraq Study Group report, uh, you can't pick apart pieces of it to implement it and expect it to have the same effect without a comprehensive perspective. The surge in U.S. troops in Iraq, while it is in, in part in the Iraq Study Group report, the surge in U.S. troops in and of itself is not sufficient without this comprehensive diplomatic effort. That's right. So that's, um, that's, that's the point I want to make. Uh, I think, Mr. Mr. Mahead, someone over here wanted to speak? Yes. Mr. Diaz Bauer. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the four of you for um, uh, patiently uh, just waiting. We meet here late at night uh, on this most serious issue. And uh, for having uh, not only exercised your patience, but brought forth to us uh, the product of much uh, hard work and thought. Uh, I think, with regard to the reason you're here, uh, that you have, in, on this critical issue, the right to present your amendments in the nature of a substitute. Uh, before our colleagues, and we'll be uh, asking the committee, uh, certainly supporting your effort uh, when we vote on the rule. So thank you very much, and it's uh, all four of you, as, as always, have been uh, most illustrative, and uh, uh, I simply reiterate my respect and my thanks. Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, I just want to say something, uh, having listened to the give and take here. Uh, First of all, I, I think it's important to state that I think the American people are way ahead of the politicians of Washington when it comes to this war. I'll give you an example. I was, uh, you mentioned the Senate, uh, and what the Senate tried to do. I was, I was at a function this morning at a, uh, uh, at a hospital in Massachusetts. Doctors, nurses, administrators, um, other health care professionals. And I fully expected to be grilled on the Medicare proposals in the President's budget. Not a question. Questions were all in Iraq, and their anger at the other body for what they thought was kind of amateur hour, that they couldn't get together and, 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 and pass anything, you know, uh, with one voice. We could argue about what went on over there and, and who was at fault and all that kind of stuff, but the bottom line is that I think there's a, you know, anybody who's gone home to their districts, you hear growing que uh, more questions, growing concerns, and a growing frustration. And anger. You know, and, and anger over what appears to be our inability to do anything. And, um, you know, and look at I, mean, I look at this resolution that's before us today. I mean, uh, you know, you know, if I had total control, it probably wouldn't be the resolution I would bring to the floor. I mean, I, 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 I think we're kind of beyond the non-binding days, uh, in my opinion. But you know what? I'm not sure I'm the majority on that. Uh, but to me, the significance of the resolution that Mr. Skelton and Mr. Lantos and Mr. Jones have kind of brought before us um, is that I, I, I think it is simple. I think it is clear. And my hope is, and I disagree with you, Mr. Shays, on this, about, about the impact. You know, I've come, I've come to believe that if this thing passes, um, it'll be the first time that this Congress has ever gone on record is even mildly dissenting from what's happening in Iraq. And I hope it's kind of a wake-up call for the White House um, to sit down and to roll up their sleeves and work with people in a bipartisan way. Mr. Cardoza talked earlier about letters that he sent to the White House that have gone unanswered. I can tell you the same thing about me. I think Republicans and Democrats can talk to you, you know, at length about um, about uh, about overtures that we have made to try to get some response to some ideas that uh, that we thought were innovative and might actually help. Maybe they weren't always comprehensive as, as, as put forward by the Iraq uh, Study Commission, but they were honest attempts at trying to solve the problem over there um, and trying, in some, in my opinion, to try to get us out of this mess. And it just seems that it's fallen on deaf ears. Uh, and it is a frustrating feeling. And so, I mean, the people that I, talk with this morning said just please do you know, speak clearly I mean, let's have a modicum of clarity on this issue at least initially um, and as uh, chairwoman slaughter pointed out I mean this is the 
I mean, this is kind of a, the beginning of what I think is going to be, um, you know, a multi-tiered process. I mean, you have the uh, uh, emergency supplemental appropriations bill coming up. You have defense authorization and defense appropriations bills coming up. But I also think that if, in fact, we can get the administration's attention on this, um, you know, then it, you know, and if it's not made in order today, I mean, I, I think this this idea of coming forward with something more comprehensive on the Iraq Study Group, you know, is something that probably would enjoy broad bipartisan support. But I mean, I, I guess we're at a point now where I think I'm reluctant to muddy up the wa waters, um, and um, you know, maybe that's not the right way to be thinking about this, but it's the way I'm thinking about it right now. <laughs> Listening to what my constituents have said over and over and over again. Why don't you say anything? Why don't you do anything? You know, why can't you, why can't you bring some of these issues to the floor and have up or down votes on them? You know, if you think that there's problems with this war in Iraq, then, you know, what, you know, stop issuing press releases, do something. And I think that this is a meaningful, you know, uh, more than a symbolic gesture. I think this is a very meaningful first step, something that we have yet to do uh, in this Congress. If we could go, get beyond this first step, um, you know, I hope it opens the doors for a more productive relationship with the White House. Um, and if not, then I think what's going to happen is that you're going to see on the emergency supplemental appropriations bills comprehensive proposals br being brought up to basically tell the President how we think our policy should be run. Uh, that's not the ideal situation. I mean, I disagree with this President more than I can articulate on what he has done in Iraq. But I want, more than anything else, to have him work with us to get us out of this war. I think that's the most effective way to do this. That's the best way to do this. Um, and, but it's been difficult to try to get his attention. And maybe this first step might get his attention. I hope it does. Um, if it doesn't, then you're going to see um, more legislation down the road. So I, I appreciate what everybody's doing here. But uh, you know, um, when you mentioned the Senate, it just kind of touched the nerve, because uh, I mean, that was the discussion at the hospital group this morning about how disappointed and frustrated they were with what they saw unfold over there. I hope we can speak with one voice, um, you know, or, or, a, or, a, or a large bipartisan majority um, this week on this issue. I thank all the people testifying. Mr. Hastings. Thank you. One of the arguments that we have heard here uh, today is criticism of the President and his conduct of the war. Uh, we've heard it from many people. Mr. McGovern just uh, talked about that. By implication, one could draw the conclusion that the criticism is, is of, the, of the President and the White House for not communicating with the Congress. That's the implication, division of powers and so forth. If that's the basis primarily of what our arguments are, then I think the case has been made to make Mr. Wolf's amendment in order, because the Iraq Study Group is a product of the Congress. I don't recall you were the prime sponsor of that, Frank. I think it passed with overwhelming support. And so if you want to have a debate, then, that is bipartisan in nature, it seems to me that this ought to be made in order, because the product of what the Congress, apparently at that time, I don't know, Frank, you were the one that drafted that, but you may have had some frustrations with the White House and said, uh, maybe we ought to have another look at it. Thus, uh, thus you sponsored that legislation that came up with the Iraq Study Group. So it seems to me that the case has been made here uh, that uh, this amendment ought to be made in order if the debate is because the White House isn't listening. So I hope it will be made in order. No further comments. I want to thank you gentlemen very much for being with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your good work. Uh, that concludes the hearing portion of this uh, hearing, and our, our committee will be in a brief recess, 10 or 15 minutes, I'm told, and then we will come back and, and report out. Before we do that, though, I want to say how, just a moment, if you don't mind, I am extremely proud I am of this committee, and I think this is one of the best debates that I recall we've had, and thank you all for participating in that, and I hope it's indicative of what we'll hear on the floor for the next two or three days. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.
House Democrats have proposed a non-binding resolution that opposes the administration's plan to increase the number of troops in Iraq. The House Rules Committee hearing voted to allow each member of the House five minutes to speak on the House.